I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's check first word news. President Obama campaigned for Hillary Clinton today at a get out the vote rally in Miami. The president urged her supporters to take advantage of the opportunity to vote before Election Day. All the progress we've made goes out the window if we don't win this election. So we've got to work our hearts out this week. We got to work like our future depends on it because it actually depends on it. Also on the campaign trail in Florida, Donald Trump hit back. This guy ought to be back in the office working. He's not going to be there very long, thank goodness. But he ought to be back in the office working. In South Carolina, friends and family of Walter Scott, an unarmed black man shot and killed by a white police officer last year, testified today after opening statements in the former officer's murder trial. Cell phone video footage showed Michael Slager shooting Scott in the back as he ran from his car after being pulled over. Slager faces 30 years to life if convicted. Syrian troops will allow rebels to leave Aleppo during a temporary break in fighting declared by Moscow. That's according to the Russian military, which says two corridors near the borders will stay open Friday during what's called a humanitarian pause. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. Bloomberg Technology is next. I'm Brad Stone, in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, GoPro shares nosedive over 20% after a disappointing third quarter snapshot. We'll break down the numbers. Plus, escalating cyber threats with the US elections just days away. We'll catch up with CrowdStrike CEO. And Fox hits a home run with the most watched World Series game in 25 years, but the NFL suddenly appears to have a ratings problem. First to our lead, GoPro shares plummeting as much as 25% in extended trading. It's become the latest hardware maker to say it expects a lousy holiday season. The company lowered its sales forecast for the fourth quarter to between 600 and 650 million, missing analyst estimates. GoPro also missed the estimates for third quarter sales, reporting over 240 million in revenues, down 40% year over year. Net loss was 104 million, down more than 650% from the same quarter last year. CEO Nick Woodman told investors on the earnings call that the production issues were to blame for the weak results. As a consequence of our compromised production ramp, we were unable to fully restock channels which had been cleared of legacy products during the third quarter. And furthermore, we anticipate difficulty catching up to meet forecasted demand during the fourth quarter. Joining us now for more is Jitendra Worrell of Bloomberg Intelligence and from New York, Bloomberg Technology reporter Selena Wang. Jitendra, GoPro back? stock plummeting like a drone that hits a power line. After what? thinking that it's going to take off first. <laughs> After thinking that it would scale to the skies, what is going? What is ailing GoPro? So now, now they're blaming production issues for not being able to meet targets. But you know, this is really a bad execution story over here because they didn't have a product last year. Uh, there was no refresh, uh, so there was quite a lot of time uh, that happened. They finally fixed the ease of use issues that people had. Finally, there new products and drones and and you take that and marry that with production issues I mean it's just not it just raises a lot of concerns about the execution risks over here Selena getting into the drone business was supposed to provide a next act for GoPro what you know when you look at this balance sheet and the way that Wall Street has reacted to the third quarter results is there are there any bright spots for GoPro I mean, Woodman was very coy about saying anything about the karma. What he did say was that in the fourth quarter, it would be a pretty small proportion of the revenue compared to the new camera. I really... The biggest thing they have going for them really is their brand at this point. If you look at the DJI, they've been in this business for 10 years. They have excellent features. They have more features, in fact, better sensors, better technology. The price point is quite similar. So if you're looking at it pure, from a pure tech standpoint, really DJI wins out in this area. There's also tons of startups getting into this business as well with lower end machines. So really the brand is the only bright spot for GoPro because more people in the U.S. know about GoPro. Right, DJI being the Shenzhen-based drone maker, uh, you know, has been in the business for a number of years. Was GoPro surprised by DJI's competitive response 
to its drone plans, right? It, it introduced its own drone very soon after GoPro made its announcement. Well, this is GoPro's first drone versus DJI's drone king. So that was kind of expected. I mean, what's interesting is like the supply chain issues across the drone industry seems to be pretty much similar. I mean, even DJI is having some shipping issues. Now, what GoPro is saying that they're expecting double digit growth next year. Now, expectations are more than 20%. We don't know what that double digit really means. And if even looking at the execution that they have shown so far, we just concern about like, are they able to pull off uh, the opportunity that they have in, in drones. And when you say supply chain issues, what does that mean? Like in DJI, the production issues, can, can you order issues. one of these new drones for this yeah. holiday season? Uh, you can, but you can't get it. You can order it, uh, and they will take your money, but they will does probably it, not Does it get to. here for Christmas? Um, maybe. It, now they're saying December for DJI. Karma is saying November 28th, uh, but um, but beyond beyond that, you know, we were really hoping that they could leverage their brand, the massive brand that they have in terms of upselling to the 10 million plus customers. And the interest level was pretty high as well, you know, when we did our surveys. But if these guys are not able to meet the demand or not able to resolve these production issues, I mean, uh, that's uh, that's raising a lot of execution risks for the company. Selena, you wrote a story that uh, highlighted problems problems at another hardware maker, Fitbit, and of course we've drawn some connections here between these two companies and their poor performance. Are they related? Is there a kind of secular problem among all these hardware companies as we head in to the very important holiday season? There is a fascinating correlation between the two companies. I mean, they're both young companies that have recently IPO'd. Uh, they were IPO to much fanfare and they really just haven't lived up to their expectations. I think taking a step back and looking at these companies, though their actual products have little overlap, um, they both are in markets that aren't really quite proven yet. And I think the question that investors are asking is, can you turn a sort of fad into a long-term sustainable company? I mean, you look at GoPro, they make these little tiny rugged cameras and now they're trying to do drones. But the question everyone is asking is, does everybody need a tiny little camera in addition to their smartphone? Uh, you heard analysts ask on the call, uh, you know, Nick, what actually is the grand vision for this company? You've talked about making it a media company, about really increasing the addressable market. And he said, we see ourselves at the epicenter of uh, social and capturing images and sharing that. But there are so many companies at the epicenter of that. And it's so interesting. I mean, you look at Snap, they are now calling themselves a camera company and they're probably going to make it even easier than GoPro is to take your images and directly upload them to the web and share it. Well, Selena, what is what is the next move for GoPro? I mean, earlier this year, they hired a, a very well-known designer from Apple. And actually, I remember stock bounced on the day that they made that, that hire. Have we seen the results? of that and what do you think is their next act if there is one? I do think that they've solved a lot of the core problems with the product and the software. I mean, just a year ago, it was really hard to operate the camera. They had all these buttons. Consumers were complaining about how difficult it was to use and you had to stitch together different editing software and it took a very, very long time for all of that to work together and share it. And now they've uh, they made some acquisitions, they really invested in their hardware and software, so it is much easier to do. Their next move is making that even easier, even more shareable, trying to expand their sales in drones and this whole media content strategy I think is way, way down the line. Okay, Jitendra, last word. What, what, what should Nick's next move be? focus on the execution. I mean, uh, this it's not acceptable, especially when you had such a big gap in terms of your product cycle. So taking the uh, right steps that they have done with respect to ease of use and, and leveraging the brand and trying to cross sell, they have the opportunity, but you got to move very, very quickly or you're going to lose it. Okay, Bloomberg Technology reporter Selena Wang in New York and Jitendra Waral of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you both. Thank you, Brad. Still to come, the cybersecurity firm that first pointed the finger at Russia for the DNC hack is back. CrowdStrike CEO tells us about the top cyber threats to watch on Election Day. This is Bloomberg. Verizon's AOL is cutting about 500 jobs. That's around 8% of the workforce. CEO Tim Armstrong told employees the company has added 1,500 staffers over the last year and needs to consolidate to improve operations. He also says AOL will add jobs in areas that are driving growth. Verizon bought AOL for $4.4 billion last year. 
The Internet Association is trying to make peace with President-elect Trump. This is the trade group representing 40 of the biggest Internet companies in the world, including Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Netflix, and startups from Airbnb to Uber. Silicon Valley largely opposed Trump's candidacy and found itself on the opposite side of his agenda on trade, immigration, and encryption. But in a letter addressed to the new administration, the Internet Association is trying to start a new dialogue, starting with congratulating the new president. The group's CEO, Michael Beckerman, joins us now from L.A. So first of all, Michael, have you gotten a response from the Trump administration so far? Have they even acknowledged your letter? Um, thanks, Emily, for having me on. Um, we, we've been in conversations, actually, with the Trump transition team from before the election, um, as we did with the Clinton um, transition team as part of this process. And we're looking for an open dialogue. Um, our priorities, I think, um, will be received well by the Trump administration because we're talking about creating jobs and value and competitiveness here at home. That said, the tech industry came out almost universally against Donald Trump, save for uh, the investor Peter Thiel. Do you have fear of retaliation? You know, it, it, on one hand, it seems like a big chill could set in between Washington and Silicon Valley, or it's a big fight that's waiting to happen. We have an opportunity here. The election's over. We want to start with a clean slate. Um, I think every company in every industry um, is looking to uh, start with a, a clean slate in January when the new administration comes in. And again, um, it's the president's job to make sure that our economy grows and we have opportunity here at home. And the story of permissionless innovation is something that um, has helped our companies grow here in the United States and create value here in the United States. And I do think the incoming president will be receptive to our message. So what have companies specifically said to you about what they're most concerned about? Uh, I mean, a number of issues. I mean, I certainly I think, you know, some of the rhetoric on the campaign um, was uh, a, a worry for, for many of um, our companies and executives. But when you look at the issues um, such as uh, encryption, which was something that we had very strong disagreements with the Obama administration as well. We want to educate uh, this White House that um, encryption is part of our safety and security here at home um, and, not, uh, and not something that we need to have back doors because we think that will weaken our, our security. Um, obviously, an issue like immigration reform was front and center during this campaign. Um, I think probably after they get done with um, border security and some of those issues, we do can come, we can come around to high skilled um, workers and making sure that uh, these companies can grow here in the United States. Uh, let's talk about trade. Obviously, you guys support the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Trump very clearly does not. What do you think the biggest risks are if things don't go your way? Well, I think, one, it's still in Republicans' DNA for free trade because it does bring uh, value to our economy and create jobs um, in the United States. And when you look at our industry, um, I would say the Internet is a great American export. 80% of internet users exist globally outside of the United States, um, but 80% of the jobs and value is here at home. Uh, and so some of the proposals that we had in our letter to um, President-elect Trump uh, will enable our companies to grow and be competitive around the world and create value in every single state across our country. And um, I know the, both, both candidates um, and both parties were very um, opposed to TPP during the campaign. But that doesn't mean that we can't move forward with other trade, um, trade programs to ensure that our companies can compete and grow globally. And what about net neutrality? Uh, we talked about this in depth uh, yesterday. It's, ve it's very unclear what Trump actually believes from a policy perspective, uh, but he was very dismissive of it in a tweet a couple of years ago. Um, you know, what would you like to see happen uh, when it comes to net neutrality when it's clear there could be some changes to the current policy? Yeah, on net neutrality, um, all we're asking for is um, to make sure that consumers have access to the entire Internet um, and you don't have gatekeepers in between Internet users and the sites they're trying to visit. And, and really, I think that's a bipartisan, um, that's a bipartisan uh, desire. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats have said that ISPs, service providers, shouldn't be blocking or throttling content. And that's all we seek. And, and that's what we have now um, with the proposal the FCC put in. And um, we're going to work with the new administration and Republicans and Democrats in Congress to make sure that that end result of an open Internet um, that enables for competition to happen um, exists still. 
Uh, Trump is in the process of building his leadership team. The current CTO is Megan Smith, who worked for a very long time at Google. Who would you like to see in that position in particular, or any of these cabinet positions? Uh, are, are there folks in particular that you think would be more sympathetic to uh, Silicon Valley and, and technology? Yeah, I, I do think it's important that we have that dialogue and that people from the technology industry, specifically from internet companies, um, go into the government. Uh, the staff, the um, appointed positions, the cabinet secretaries, so many positions in government um, will decide what kind of um, landscape we have for innovation going forward. And I would like to see more people like Megan Smith and like Michelle Lee at the PTO and so many others that have gone into the government from our companies and our sector to continue to do so. Uh, because this is our country, right? We wanna make sure that people that are working in government understand that the internet is one of the greatest engines for economic growth that we have. Um, and it's people like that that will um, ensure that that continues. Look, Michael, I understand a, a desire to uh, work with the, the president-elect uh, and, and to congratulate him on his win, but you know this is an industry that came out so vehemently against Donald Trump. And I'm just curious, what are what are folks saying to you from these companies behind closed doors? Are they scared? Are they nervous? Uh, and if so, what are they most nervous about? Well, you know, we're, we're you know we're still in the early days, um, you know, right after the election. I think everybody's still digesting it a bit. But there is a recognition that we need to move forward. The election is over. Um, and this is not really our companies. I feel like um, internet companies um, have gotten a lot of attention on this. Um, but um, I don't believe there were any of the Fortune 100 CEOs that were formally for um, uh, President-elect Trump like they were for Mitt Romney, let's say, uh, in 2012. And I'm, I'm sure the president-elect wants to work with our companies just like we want to work with uh, the incoming government. And um, you know, we'll, we'll move forward for what's best for this country. All right, Internet Association CEO Michael Beckerman joining us from L.A. Michael, thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks, Emily. Coming up, Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins joins us on the economic uncertainty weighing on corporate spending. This is Bloomberg. Now to a story we are watching. Airbnb has taken its first step to shift focus from a home rental business to a full service travel company. It's unveiled an updated platform called Airbnb Trips, which will give travelers tools to plan their entire vacation. The new app will help people make restaurant reservations, book city tours, and even purchase concert tickets. The Trips service will launch in a dozen cities. Cisco shares saw the biggest interday drop in a year shortly after reporting Q1 earnings Wednesday. While the company's sales rose to $12.4 billion, the company also projected slow growth in corporate spending. Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins spoke with Bloomberg's David Weston and John Farrow earlier. They started by asking how the company is doing amidst its transition from a legacy hardware business to a new software and services operation. We've been transitioning elements of our portfolio, our collaboration portfolio, our security portfolio, even our cloud management of our networking devices to more of a cloud and SaaS and subscription model. And the deferred revenue associated with that transition was up 48% this quarter. Uh, so we think that we've made a great deal of progress. Our security business continues to be strong. Uh, while we did talk about weakness in the service provider space, we also had 5% order growth in our enterprise business. So we had a lot of bright spots in the quarter as well. Now, one point of disappointment you said it's less than expected was uh, your new products business it was down 12%. What happened there and what could turn that around? Our global service provider business, new orders was down 12%. So, and this is a business that's made up of very large customers, and when several of them pause on CapEx for whatever reason, it results in a short term uh, challenge in that business. It doesn't mean there's long term issues with it. Uh, and as we talked about yesterday, there are really three or four different areas that can lead our customers to slow their CapEx spend, and we saw a lot of those going on this past quarter. You have uh, certain service providers around the world that are dealing with current challenges. You have some service providers who are dealing with, you know, political uncertainties, regulatory uncertainties. And if you look at the CapEx reports for spending through the first three calendar quarters this year, uh, they've all been, you know, slightly lower than expected. So uh, we saw that in our SP business. But again, we're very pleased with the balance of our business and lots of good uh, strong points in the report. 
So Chuck, uh, when you talk about CapEx, uh, companies don't like uncertainty. And we have a new president coming in now, and that raises some uncertainty about what those policies will be. They could be good for you, they could be bad for you. It's not too soon to start asking yourself the question, what is that gonna mean? On the one hand, for example, you can have trade problems. On the other hand, you can have uh, fiscal stimulus. So what's your take right now about, about what a Trump presidency could mean for Cisco's business? I think what you're hearing from President-elect Trump uh, is uh, most of what he's saying is really about how do we drive the U.S. economy. His policies tend to be very pro-business because he believes if business in the U.S. is strong, then the economy will strengthen, will create jobs. And I think that's being reflected through what you're hearing from him. And I also think that will come through in his policies. And, you know, the things that we care about are obviously we, patent reform is very important to us. The H-1B immigration program is very important to us, as well as tax reform. And I think that that, uh, you know, based on his desire to lift the U.S. economy, I think that uh, he'll end up looking at those policies favorably. And any time the U.S. economy gets stronger, that's certainly good for Cisco. Chuck, let's talk about tax reform. You've got $60 billion in cash overseas. If you've got a repatriation tax holiday, can you commit on this program today that you would do something with that money other than buy back stock and boost dividends? So this has been a popular question for us, as you can imagine. And uh, we have uh, obviously still been moving in all of these areas with dividends and buybacks and strategic acquisitions. We made 17 of those since I was named in this role. And so you can assume that uh, as we are allowed to bring more of that cash back at reasonable tax rates, you can assume that we would use a combination of all three of those uh, opportunities. And uh, our teams have been working on scenarios for years as we've been big proponents of tax reform. So we're optimistic and uh, we'll be leveraging that cash for all three of those. Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins there. Apple has big plans to outfit its next iPhone with vibrant organic OLED, OLED displays, but the four main suppliers for such components won't have enough production capacity to make screens for all new iPhones into 2018. This according to people familiar with the matter. Supply issues may force Apple to use OLED in just one version of its next gen iPhone or push back adoption of the technology. Coming up, Sarger, partner at Charles River Ventures, will be joining us for the rest of the hour. We will be talking the VC climate after Donald Trump's win, plus other issues impacting the tech world. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's get a check of first word news. At this hour, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is meeting with President-elect Donald Trump here in New York City. Abe, the first world leader to meet with the president-elect, reportedly wants to convince Mr. Trump to abandon the trade and security policies that he advocated during the campaign. Vice President-elect Mike Pence was on Capitol Hill, where he told House Republicans they should, quote, buckle up and get ready for a quick start on policy. Very humbling to be back uh, among my former colleagues. We're excited about moving the Trump agenda forward in the coming Congress. And I'm just so grateful, so grateful for the warm hospitality and all of their determination to work with our incoming administration to make America great again. Mr. Pence also met with House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. House Democrats want President Obama to pardon about 750,000 undocumented immigrants. They're temporarily shielded from deportation under a 2012 executive order. The request reflects growing concern about a shift in immigration policy once President-elect Trump takes office. Syrian activists and rescue workers say airstrikes pounded rebel-held eastern Aleppo, killing more than 20 people and hitting a water pumping station. It's the third day of a renewed air campaign in the city. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 6.30 p.m. Thursday here in New York City, 10.30 Friday morning in Sydney. Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. We're off to a reasonably good start here on the ASX. Uh, the uh, index up about four tenths of one percent after the first half hour of trade. Uh, the leaders are a bit of a mixed group, really. We've got uh, software company Isantia leading the gains, up almost eight percent right now. But also retailer Meyer and uh, a couple of aluminium companies doing quite well as well. Uh, gold stocks really weighing on the index at the moment. Now, the Aussie dollar weakened overnight, uh, dipping below seventy-four cents for a short time on greenback strength. 
Uh, the Aussie also came under some pressure after disappointing unemployment figures. The headline rate of 5.6% looked good, but fewer jobs than expected were created. Uh, have a look at New Zealand. The NZX up a third of 1%. Uh, Nikkei futures also looking positive. And we're waiting on some news out of Japan in the next couple of hours. Airbus due to hold a press conference. It's understood budget. Japanese carrier Peach may be getting ready to order 13 jets from Airbus. Some data out of China today with October property prices due to be released as well. That's just some of what we're watching around the Asia Pacific today. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. Chang. Ahead of the U.S. election, investors had been beginning to hit pause. In the VC world, both the value and number of deals slowed down in the third quarter, and that hesitation could spill over into the rest of the year. But what about next year? Uh, my next guest recently published a report stating consumer brands are showing more potential than traditional tech firms. Sarger is a partner at Charles River Ventures, a venture capital firm with several notable investments, including Dropbox, Twitter, ClassPass. He joins me now here in the studio. Uh, so you guys came out with a very, very strong anti-Trump message. It took over your entire website yeah. in the lead up to the election. How have you been digesting this within the firm? Yeah, I think um, I think all of us in Silicon Valley are largely in, in shock. You know, our statement at CRV was really a statement early on about immigration and specifically some of the comments that uh, Donald Trump had made about Muslims, about Mexicans. Uh, you know, I think as we try and get a handle on what's happened, I think this election really is about jobs and, and sort of first needs of, if I think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I think that the data says we really have to embrace the message of, of Americans wanting jobs, specifically in the Midwest. Um, and I guess I'm hopeful, I think all of us are hopeful that uh, at least we have someone here in Silicon Valley, Peter Thiel, that I think has a bridge mm -hmm. to the administration. I know personally, I, you know, we, I've reached out to Peter. I think a number of us are trying to figure out, hoping he takes a, a role in helping us figure out how to get engaged and how to help. What did you ask Peter? I, I think for us, it's like, how do we basically get involved? I think there's a group of us here in Silicon Valley that are, you know, want to secede from, <laughs> from the country. And I think there's a group of us that are saying, this is a reality. I think it's a real wake up call for many of us here in Silicon Valley. What do we do to be a part of those conversations and really be helpful to the Trump administration? Do you have any concerns about retaliation? You know, venture capitalists, you know, the tech, large tech company startups, they all have their own interests and Washington can help. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe it's the entrepreneur in me. I, I have to go into this, you know, with hope that Trump really does want to bridge the divide that, that clearly we have. It feels like there's a crack in our foundation that I feel like we haven't felt in a long time. Um, and I guess for me, from a, you know, just I, I, for me to move forward, my way of coping, I guess, is just to be positive, to reach out to folks like Peter, to, you know, to try and engage and figure out what we can do to be helpful. I haven't spent too much time thinking about, you know, whether I'm on a, on a bad list somewhere and, and you know, folks are going to come after us. <laughs> President Obama even came out today uh, calling out fake news on the Internet, on Facebook in particular. Do you think companies like Facebook need to take greater responsibility uh, for the, the gigantic role they play yeah. uh, in American society? I think it's a great question, Emily, and I think that the, the broader question I think we'll see take place is not just about fake news, but about the algorithms and the AI that's not only influencing the news we read, but a whole number of other decisions that we're making uh, in our lives. And so my guess is that this is kind of an early theme that we'll see get played out quite a bit. Um, I know that for Facebook, I'm, I, many of my friends there are quite shocked at the way things have turned out and their responsibility potentially, I think, is weighing on them as to, you know, how they're influencing behaviors based on fake articles, based on us, uh, you know, only reading news from our friends, et cetera. Is, Should is, they is, have more human involvement in what people see? That's right. Should they? Do you yeah. think they should? Um, I think it's very early in us understanding what moral or ethical impact uh, and rules Facebook needs to have, but it wouldn't surprise me if we do have humans helping edit the machines uh, in the near term. So what are you guys telling your portfolio companies? 
You know, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, mostly we're waiting to see, you know, to me it wasn't the election that's the news. I think it will be the presidency that's the news and the actions being taken. Uh, I can tell you that um, in different sectors we're seeing different reactions. So as an example, if you're a hardware startup, you know, Trump has said he wants Apple to manufacture computers here in the U.S. You know, do I, does that mean if I'm a hardware startup, I won't be able to manufacture my goods in, in China? If I'm a GoPro or a startup importing things and I thought the international markets were really going to work for me, it turns out there's a lot of price elasticity with consumers for these consumer hardware projects. Right. You know, a Nest that costs $100 versus $500, you'll see huge, you know, huge variance in demand. And so if we, if we, I think we can expect tariffs. Um, I think that those those will very much influence demand in international markets. So I think that's one example. I think in other sectors like energy, um, we've got issues like you know if solar subsidies go away, I think it'll have a big impact on funding related to energy startups. Um, and lastly, in terms of just the pure funding market. There's been a lot of Chinese money that's been coming into the states that's been funding not just things like AngelList that we've seen and, and kind of early seed stage startups, but also a lot of growth rounds in VR and AR. Uh, you know, we've got a number of companies that we're talking uh, to, you know, Asian investors in particular who I think have just sort of stopped everything while they wait to see what's going to happen. And have you guys hit pause as well? We haven't hit pause. You know, most of what we do is very early stage investing. Right. So um, that, I'd say but the still, things, you're seeing, you know, in the broader VC environment, investors have been hitting pause. Yeah. Well, for us, usually it takes years for our companies to actually figure out what they're actually doing. <laughs> so, so, you know, we're still very active. We're still taking meetings uh, and, and still actively investing. I will say, though, on the talent side, one of the things that's been interesting to me is, you know, core to us building companies is recruiting. Mm -hmm. and. In you know many of the larger organizations that we tend to recruit from, I, I don't want to be ageist, I guess, but older employees that have seen a few cycles know how tough it can be to work at a startup when the funding environment drives up. And a number of my friends at larger companies like Google, like Facebook, who thought that 2017 would be the year they would leave and take some risk and join a startup, they've put those plans on pause. All right, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about immigration. We're going to talk a little bit more about IPOs. Uh, coming up, Sargar, partner at Charles River Ventures, sticking with me. More on that story that I just mentioned. President Obama is weighing in on the fake news that circulated during the U.S. presidential election. At a news conference in Berlin, Obama said democracy will break down if we cannot differentiate between serious arguments and propaganda. He continued by saying fake articles can poison politics and, quote, we won't know what we're fighting for. Coming up, the global IPO market has declined 35% this year. So what does the future hold for public offerings under a Trump presidency? We will discuss. And this weekend on Bloomberg Television, we bring you all of our best interviews from the week, including our interview with Palantir co-founder Joe Lonsdale. Will the security company go public in the age of Trump? Peter Thiel, also a founder of Palantir, by the way. Tune in this Saturday for the best of Bloomberg Tech. This is Bloomberg. A story we are watching, Microsoft will tie executive bonuses to workforce diversity goals. This after the company saw a second consecutive year of declines in the percentage of women employees. Women working at Microsoft uh, has fallen 25.8% to 25.8% from 26.8%. This fall is largely due to uh, the company's exit from Nokia's phone handset market. Global IPO volumes have fallen 35% in 2016 compared to last year. And after Trump's surprise election victory, many investors are left wondering how the market will be affected in the future. In the latest edition of Bloomberg Business Week, Bloomberg's Alex Barinka writes about certain un uh, uncertainty, certain uncertainty in the U.S. IPO market. She joins me now from New York. Still with us, our guest host, Sargur, a partner at Charles River Ventures. So, Alex, I'll start with you. Obviously, uh, still a lot of uncertainty, still a lot of wait and see. Uh, but what, with it, when it comes to the IPO market in particular, what are we expecting under a Trump presidency? So you have to think about kind of what plays into the IPO market to kind of get to that answer. If you look on the, the issuer side, uh, like you said, it's been a really slow year. So there are a lot of companies that maybe were thinking they could get out in 2016 that are in the pipeline. All of my sources are saying that the backlog for companies ready to go is pretty deep. So when it comes to getting out then, the other big piece of the equation 
are the markets. And uncertainty, IPO, bankers, companies going rue uncertainty because it can cause volatility in equities. And if stocks are volatile, you cannot take a company public. So the fact that there are questions around policy, how it will affect uh, US stocks going forward, these are all things that on a macro level will make it more difficult to go. I will tell you, Emily, I have not heard of any notable companies, and I have checked, that have delayed actually going out. Uh, if anything, they're, they're kind of accelerating the process to get out early next year before any kind of uh, impact from the Donald would play into U.S. stocks. <laughs> uh, well, Snapchat, of course, we know now has filed for its IPO. They did file before the elections are. You guys are investors in Dropbox, which we've reported is considering going public in the near future. Any change of plans? Uh, none that I can state for Dropbox specifically. And what do you think about, I mean, would you advise a company to, to, to stay the course at this point or to, to wait and see, wait it out a little yeah. longer? Yeah, there's a number of companies that were waiting to see how the election would play out, knowing there would likely be uncertainty in the market around a change in an administration. And that was when they, you know, when we largely expected Hillary to win. So there is that backlog. Many of my banker friends are very active with companies that, that need to get out. The thing that's interesting to me about the Snapchat IPO is actually we've had a number of companies that here in Silicon Valley we call the Decacorns, the Airbnbs, the Ubers, the very big companies. Those hot companies haven't felt pressure because there's been a ton of private investor interest and they've stayed private, Palantir, or some of these other companies. Um, and so a lot of the companies that have gone out have been the ones that have almost needed to go out. Mm. Right, pure storage and, and some others. Um, I think for me, what's interesting about Snapchat is they're actually one of the few companies that, in the spirit of transparency and the spirit of a, a, you know a number of things, I think are going public. And I think hopefully will will sort of break the dam for a number of other companies to come out. Uh, what about some of those decacorns, Alex? That Sarah mentions, obviously Uber, Airbnb. You know, Snapchat has now at least beaten these guys to filing. Um, you know, how do you think? a Trump presidency uh, and this uncertainty, at least right now, will impact some of these companies that have you know, certainly been, been planning to go public at least sometime in the next couple of years. So it seems like, so the, the wheels are in motion for Snap. Um, they are, as, as our sources have told us, looking to raise as much as $4 billion in the first quarter of 2017. For the bigger companies, you know, you look at Uber, you look at Airbnb, both of those have regulatory roadblocks they need to work through. Um, as we talked about in the past, before Uber sold its China business to Didi, they needed to kind of resolve that issue. So there are still kind of big issues around some of the big companies that uh, they need to work through. It seems like if they want to go and get out and go public, they will be able to. And, and Emily, I'll point to the interview uh, that Lonsdale, the co-founder of Palantir, had with Bloomberg Television. He is an early investor, and he even admitted that his ideas of when to go public might be different than others around that company. So it, a lot of factors will play into this. I haven't heard that Trump is one of them. For the smaller companies, though, uh, the domestic-based companies, which is a majority of tech IPOs in a given year, the one policy Trump has been really clear on the fact that he wants to get done is bringing that tax rate down uh, from 35% for corporate uh, entities in the U.S. to 15%. And when it comes to uh, you know future earnings, uh, that is actually would be a good thing for these companies that are mostly based in the U.S., don't have any uh, interesting overseas tax arrangements, and are paying that 35 percent. So, you know, the smaller companies, some of the policies that we know of could actually be a positive. For the bigger companies, it definitely seems like it's going to be about, uh, are they ready? Uh, do they think they can get out at a decent valuation? And are the okay. markets open? All right, Alex Barinka, our IPO reporter there in New York, Charles River Venture Partner, Sarger, sticking with me here in the studio. Coming up tomorrow on Bloomberg, St. Louis Fed President James Bullard will be on Bloomberg TV from Euro Finance Week in Frankfurt, 7 a.m. Eastern Time, this coming just weeks before the Fed holds its final meeting of the year. Plus, there are now tens of thousands of U.S. tech workers whose future is in doubt thanks to Donald Trump's comments on immigration. We're going to talk about that Trump's tech talent problem next. This is Bloomberg.
One of the signature issues that won Donald Trump the White House was immigration. In the newest edition of Bloomberg Business Week, we report that more than half the U.S. startups worth at least a billion dollars have an immigrant founder. The companies getting the most H-1B visas a year, Amazon and Microsoft. Trump has flip-flopped on the issue, most recently saying that H-1Bs don't count as highly skilled work. He said the program is meant to bring in cheap labor, replace U.S. jobs, and that he'd end it, quote, forever. Joining us now to discuss, Bloomberg Tech reporter Ellen Hewitt, who wrote that piece coming out in Bloomberg Business Week, and our guest, Sargur of Charles River Ventures. So, Ellen, uh, first of all, uh, the headline of the piece is America's Got No Talent. Um, and you talk about how tech workers right now are in limbo. What are you hearing? We're talking to tech workers who are here on visas that rely on the existence of NAFTA, tech workers that are here on H-1B visas, and these are people who work throughout Silicon Valley. These are people creating important value for these huge companies, and they are honestly unsure about what might come next. You know, we talked to people who are weighing whether they should go ahead with plans to buy a house, whether they are thinking about continuing to raise their children in Silicon Valley with this feeling that they don't feel as welcome as they once were. And, and, and it's kind of a very personal and also a professional question for them. Sorry, in the last couple of years, Mark Zuckerberg has been fighting to increase the cap on H-1B visas. Now we're just fighting to, you are just fighting yeah. to maintain the status quo. Um, if some of these policies change, how big of an impact uh, would it have on Silicon Valley? It's a huge impact. You know, Facebook is a great example of a company that for a long time said their headquarters would always be here and they wouldn't have big offices outside of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And it's been so hard to recruit talent into Facebook that now we have large Facebook offices in New York and London and other places. You add an H-1B cap or, or restrict immigrants, and I think you're going to see the Facebook London office probably <laughs> expand significantly relative to what Zuck originally had planned, as well as for many of our companies here. Of course, we're still, again, waiting yeah. and seeing a lot of uncertainty. Uh, uh, some old quotes from Steve Bannon, who's a big part of the Trump transition team, have been unearthed, where he basically indicates that Silicon Valley has too many Asian CEOs. And Trump, in the same conversation, to his credit, says, uh, but I still think we should, believe we should be bringing in skilled workers and talented people. Uh, so again, Ellen, it's, it's, it's really unclear where exactly he's going to fall on this. Right. I talked to people who, you know, looked to comment, you know, com comments from Trump on exactly that same point. We need to keep uh, and recruit talented people into the U.S. as sort of a beacon that maybe that's something that he really values. On the other hand, it is really hard not to take his comments about the H-1B program um, and take them without fear because that is a major tool by which a lot of companies recruit people in, you know, that they rely on this. And every year it's, in, it's already in such huge demand to have anyone talk about making it more restricted is something that I think strikes fear in a lot of companies' hearts. Now, to be devil's advocate, uh, you know, there are other ways to tackle this problem aside from just, you know, raising the cap on visas, and that is, you know, education. So why don't we have enough people in the United States who can do these jobs? I think, if anything, this election is, is forcing us to look at the displacement of technology uh, with, with the rest of America. I mean, I think that, that is the core issue, and I think we're going to have to revisit that. Clearly, everything we've been doing has not been enough. And to me, that's, that's the key question, I think, that is sort of rattled Silicon Valley to its core. So I don't have any great answers for you today. You know, we've invested in a number of those companies like Udacity and, and Flatiron School and others that are trying to help make it easier and reduce the friction for folks to learn things like programming. But, uh, you know, there's, we've got a long way to go. Other than waiting and seeing Ellen, you know, what are people doing? I mean, Sar said earlier, he emailed Peter Thiel and said, what can we do? How can we be part of this? Um, but, you know, is anyone taking action? Yeah, I mean, and we have companies like, you know, firms like Charles River Ventures offering to make it easier for, for example, um, foreign founders to come to the U.S. and start businesses. Um, I think that's also been an issue that's very close to the heart of Silicon Valley, this idea that we could have people come as immigrants to the U.S. and not take jobs, but rather start their own companies and create jobs. Um, that's another visa program that, um, or, you know, visa dream that has a little bit more of a shadow on it after Trump because he's vowed to undo Obama's actions around sort of startup visas and that is something that we could see get reduced in the future or become less likely. All right, Ellen Hewitt, looking forward to seeing your piece in you. uh, Business Week tomorrow. Sargur of Charles River Ventures, thank you so much for Thanks stopping for by. It's been great to have you.
Now, in this edition of Out of This World, a Soyuz rocket carrying three new crew members blasted off for the International Space Station Thursday. The crew includes veteran NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson. She will celebrate her 57th birthday aboard the ISS in February and would become the oldest woman in space adding to her long list of records. Whiston was the first woman to serve as space station commander in 2007 and remains the only woman to head NASA's male-dominated astronaut corps. Whitson has already spent 377 days in space. This upcoming six-month mission will push her beyond the U.S. record set this year by astronaut Jeffrey Williams. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 6 p.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.